Heavenly Father, we come before you today in our last session of James, and we just thank you so much for all that we have already learned, what we're going to be discussing today, the truths in this book, and how thankfully you have preserved it all these years so that we can go back to it and back to it, not from a position of, oh, I know it all, but from a, oh, I need to be reminded of that again, and the conviction falling from the Holy Spirit we always want to remember that we come before anything asking for that wisdom from you, that your spirit will guide our discussion, that it will give us constraints as well. Keep us in um, in your will and in your word, in your way, um, that we would also have it so ingrained in us that it would absolutely come out of us as well in our actions in our words to others you know in our own lives you know reminding us of what we need to what we need to be doing we thank you for it we ask you for it we continue to ask you for it and we just open up ourselves to whatever truths that you would want us to know and how we are to act, a walk away. We also know that we're going to deal with a slightly controversial subject today or a difficult, maybe not so much controversial, but difficult type subject where varying opinions can be a part of this. So we just really want to know at the basic level, foundational level, what it is we can know from this, and then let your your guidance carry us forward into our lives, and that we would respect people um, and, and those areas where there might be differences of opinion. So we know there's only one true interpretation, and we're not always the ones that get that, but we do ask for it. So we thank you for it, ask you for it, um, want to be guided by it, and we do all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. Okay, welcome. And if anybody else shows up, I will try to let them in. But this is our last session of James, which is kind of hard to believe um, in a way. And as I was saying earlier before the recording, um, 10 weeks is also a, a good amount of time for us to have been really marinating in this book. Um, we we want to leave with a really great grasp of it, especially the overall approach and what James is trying to convey while not ever feeling like we have such a firm grasp on it that, you know, that, that we couldn't be open to differences of thought and that God would guide us in different ways at different times in our lives. But that when we come back to it, it could be from a place of familiarity. Um, sorry, I meant to do the do not disturb and forgot to do that. So you might hear notifications. Sorry about that. Okay, so as we jump in, let's do a review of the whole book. As we looked at James as a whole, what are we, what is the overall thing that we know about James and why he's writing? If you remember maybe the theme, the key first that's the theme, um, or what we thought is a is a good possible theme for the book. Um <laughs> Doer of the word. I heard doers of the word, proving ourselves doers of the word. And what were you saying, Sandy? I said the same thing, believers and doers of the word. Okay, having faith, being a believer and being a doer of the word, not a hearer only is how the verse reads in chapter, I think it's one, it's 22, but prove yourself doers of the word and not mere, mere, merely hearers who delude themselves. And we believe that that is a good summary statement. Um, or another is faith that works, because this is about doing and working and how not working to salvation, but how salvation works out of us and the outcome of having been saved. Um, Kay keeps talking about it being a, a practical faith, you know, a faith that um, actually can be applied and is worked out. Um, so those are all like great summary statements for this book. And then every individual little uh, subject should fall under that in and in, in be a part, of, be supporting of that overall theme. Not that we're going to shoehorn it in or, or make it fit, but that it actually should. That means our theme is actually good if all the individual different themes fit it. So in James 1, it comes out of the gate 
talking about what? What are what are they going through and what is he encouraging them to do as a result? Trials and temptations. Yes. Um, so pressures, trials, temptations, and what are they to do as a result of, of that being in their lives? Have wisdom, yes. have patience. Yes. So that persevering, that endurance, that patience, and then as, asking for the wisdom that's going to be required for them to know how to get through it, right? And and I, we, we like to stress that because, again, at, we don't like to be uncomfortable. You know, okay, hang on, there's a couple of people. None of us like to be uncomfortable. We like to get out of discomfort as quickly and as we possibly can. And yet, if we if we remove ourselves and it wouldn't be God's will to do so, let's say, from some of those circumstances, we're not going to get the end result. And the end result, which is described right there in chapter one, is, you know, the the perfect result, which is that we'd be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And, and we talked about, we know perfect doesn't mean we never make mistakes. It means maturing matured you know we're we're working towards that end goal of Christ likeness okay so persevering and being steadfast in trials um receiving the word and doing the word that's all part of chapter 1 there's other little things but those are the big broad ones how about chapter 2 no partiality or favoritism in faith Yes, obviously that was a problem. It's a problem today. You know, we we have to watch that, knowing that if we're going to be again Christ-like, Christ does not is not a respecter of persons. Is what the Bible says. God is not a respecter of persons, and all that means is He doesn't look at a person and say, "Oh, look, this guy's got a whole lot of money. I'm going to give him more favor than somebody that doesn't because he's a better person." No, God doesn't look at things that way at all. Um, we have a tendency to look at things that way. We as humans look on the appearance of a person. God looks on their heart, all those things that we know. So we're not to show partiality because God does not show partiality in those ways of favoring them, causing them to, to be honored at their gatherings, etc. And the last of the chapter was a more controversial subject at times in some in some areas, or at least a difficult passage, and that has to do with faith and works, which is a big aspect and a big theme throughout James. <clears throat> and the idea here is if you have faith, it will show up in your works. Goes back to being proving yourself to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. But there are some that just want to say faith, 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 and I've got it, you know, and I don't have to prove it out in any way. And James is writing and saying, if you have no works, your faith is dead. It isn't faith is, is another way of putting it. You have something like you, you believe in something about yourself, but you're not believing in God for salvation because it will come out. It's in you. It will come out of you is one way of putting it. In James 3, what is one of the big topics of James 3? Taming the tongue. Absolutely. Taming the tongue. Um, difficult. You know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it you get it and then you, you mess up and then you get it. And it's not giving us an excuse by saying no one can tame the tongue. It's saying that should be our goal. You know, while we, again, perfection is not never doing anything wrong. Perfection is working towards Christ's likeness. And in doing so, uh, exercising control over our tongue is inherent in that, should be inherent in that. But it's going to be a struggle. It's always going to be a struggle. Um, and then it's talking about the wisdom from above. That wisdom um, comes down from God and we we can ask for it. We saw in chapter one, we need to be praying and asking for it. Um, and then James four, what's James four mostly about? 
Humility and pride. Humble dependence. Yes. Humility and pride, humble dependence. Uh, those are great ways of putting it. So we are to be humbling ourselves. And um, and then also specifically not speaking out. Like if we're focusing on ourselves and our need for that dependence and humility towards God and not having pride and, and doing the self-awareness check, we're not, we should not have time for speaking out against our brothers, uh, fellow Christians, uh, slandering them. This would be not just um, telling the truth when needed, uh, but this would be offensive talk, something that is purposely trying to hurt someone. Um, we don't have, we wouldn't have time for that. We would be like going, you know, who am I when I got this stuff to deal with? And we wouldn't be turning and looking at others. But again, it's a lot easier to focus on everybody else in the room than it is to look at ourselves. I mean, I've, I've been guilty of sitting in a, a service, listening to a pastor give a good message that's true and from the word and thinking about everybody in the room that needs to hear that message <laughs> or everybody not in the room that should be in the room to hear that message. And I mean, the conviction falls and I go, oh, Lord, OK, what is it I need to know right now? Um, it's not to say that I might be right, <laughs> that that person needs to hear that message. But mainly, whenever I'm hearing something, God is talking to me, working out something in me. And but as I even say in our prayers, whatever he does give to us, he gives to us possibly to be conveying to others and telling others about as well. Maybe it's just handing along knowledge and information and wow, this is really cool new thing I've never heard before. Could be that. Okay, now in chapter five, and we're gonna finish chapter five today, but what overall is he dealing with in chapter five? A rebuke to the ungodly rich. Yes. So yes, that's a great way of putting a rebuke to the ungodly rich, because the description of the rich there, even though the whole book is written to a group of Jewish believers throughout that have been dispersed because of that diaspora and, and, and things going on and the persecutions going on. We know that really within any group that we believe is Christians, there's probably non-Christians there. And in this case, when he describes the rich and their final end judgment, it is not that of a Christian. So how are they acting? And we've seen rich before. We've seen again in that favoritism of chapter two, what were they doing? They were saying, <clears throat> rich, come sit down, you know, in the front and to the poor, you know, you take the seat in the back or stand back there or sit on the stool at this person's feet. And James is kind of like incredulous and in saying, aren't the rich the ones that are dragging you into court? right? So the rich are withholding pay wages to their the workers. They seem to have no compassion or no ability to uh, empathize with somebody that's not rich. And we, we know, again, this is true of all humans, but it was very true and entrenched in the Jewish culture that if you were wealthy, you had God's favor. And if you weren't wealthy, something's wrong with you. And again, we have to think about, do we, do we think that? Do we not, like, it's usually not a really resonant thought. It's usually more like we catch ourselves acting a certain way. It's like, oh, wow, they must be doing something right. You know, look at their big house or look at what all they can afford, whatever. So we've got to watch that within the talk to the rich and then also following is a big theme about end times about jesus's return and the certainty of jesus's return is one thing but also the certainty that when he returns it's not if when he returns he's returning as judge he's returning to set up his kingdom we know that and some are going to get in and some are not so to these rich or to all of us, if we live with that in mind, that at any second, any moment, any second, Jesus could return. And you think about, again, like being that child doing something wrong and hoping you don't get caught. Um, that's not what I'm hoping you're living like. But if we do have that 
in our forefront of our thinking that the righteous judge could return at any moment. What's he going to find us doing? What's he going to say to us when he returns? Are we going to have time to clean up our act before that? You know, just think it could happen at any second. Um, I heard something on Sunday that I think is is very, very true. In there's been kind of, there's always these like waves of teaching and new thoughts and everything else in Christianity, but we've sometimes been lacking in education, like just the knowledge of God and his word. So we fix that by stuff like this great Bible study, great preaching from the pulpit, nothing wrong, nothing wrong, but that isn't everything. And then maybe we shift towards, well, it's not about educating all the time because you know that's its own thing but it's about it's about programs and doing and and getting out there but that's not what it's all about either if we would focus on obedience the lordship of jesus christ a healthy fear of the lord because we should be living what was the description of job Righteous and upright, fearing the Lord always, right? That's commendable. And we need to be living. I don't, I, a lot of people do not like thinking about God being feared. And they want to only say, well, I do respect him. That's the fear I want to, I want to focus on. Totally fine. You know, be respectful of God. Absolutely. That is one way to look at fear. But there's another aspect of don't fear man who can only kill the body. Fear God who can both destroy the body and the soul. Right? I think it's Jesus that said that. <laughs> right? So there is a healthy aspect to understanding what he's capable of. And living in our life in light of that. So when he comes, he's coming in judgment. Do you want to fall under that judgment? I don't. I would, I want to live my life in such a way, understanding there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, but I live knowing I, I have to evaluate my life by actions moment by moment all the time in light of what would he have me do what would jesus do right okay so that healthy remembrance of jesus's return and it's actually a promise i mean there's so much positive to it too is i was just reading about i think it's in first second thessalonians about you know when he comes He's coming with vengeance. So it doesn't, all this stuff that the people in the book of James are dealing with, or in first, second, and third John they're dealing with, or in Thessalonians they're dealing with any of those persecutions and hard times, or that we're dealing with in our lives. Um, leave that retribution to God because he's going to do it perfectly. If I get involved in the vengeance aspect, I'm going to mess it up. And then I'm going to fall under the judgment and I don't want that. So keep those balances, keep those thoughts. Now, as we roll into verses 13 through the end, verse 20, what is the overall theme of those verses in James chapter five? Prayer. Prayer. Right. So there's like different circumstances that he mentions. And then he kind of focuses many verses on a particular aspect of it. But what's the first way or time he talks about praying? Who's praying and why? Anyone who's There's of the church. Okay, I had two people talking at the same time. Go ahead, somebody. Elders of the church, the fellow Christians praying uh, for one another. Yes, those are at least two of the different aspects. The very first one in chapter 13, though, is specific to what? Suffering. Suffering, okay. And who is praying? Let him pray. Yes, the one who is suffering. <laughs> right. Okay, so that's just the first one. 
Then right after that, it says something that's kind of interesting. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. We're going to come back to this in a second, but I just want to get these basic <clears throat> ideas down. Then the next one is under what circumstance is prayer mentioned in verse 14? If anyone is sick. Right. Who is praying? This is the one, Dorothy, you were talking about earlier. Elders. Yes. Right. yes, elders. You call for elders. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna go into detail more, but I just wanted to get these up here. So then it's so it's suffering and then sick, and what's the next one? What circumstances? Sin. Okay. Confession. Let's let's keep it a with our S alliteration, right? Right. So it's confession is going to be a part of that, right? Okay. Who is praying? The person who committed the sin. Well, number one, he's confessing, right? So right. we have a, a yes, I would say the person, but who else? The elders of the church. Elders. And who else? There's one more. One more set. Each other. One another. Yes. One another. Or others. Or however you want to put that. Okay. So I just kind of wanted to show you that we're not going hard and fast like, oh, if you're suffering, I'm the only one that can pray for myself. But it's just saying, what is it saying there? If a person is suffering, let him pray. If someone is sick, then let him call for the elders. And kind of mixed in there, there might be sin. And if so, there needs to be confession. Then the person is confessing. He can be a part of the elders praying for him. But then it also says, confess to one another and pray for one another. Okay, it's all mixed in there, right? Okay, these are just the broad statements and the broad categories. We're going to look at it a little in a little more detail. Okay, I said earlier, maybe in my prayer earlier, that this is a this could be controversial, but I'd really rather say it's a difficult passage. Like, um, for instance, is this being practiced that you have seen? And if it is, is it practiced correctly? Okay. Well, and I'm glad. I like I like seeing him nodding heads. <laughs> but I was I was helped quite a bit when I was going through my son's ordeal. So fantastic. I mean, really fantastic. <laughs> um, and I and I think that's there's there's so many all kinds of great things, but this also can be misused. Like people can come, they can read a couple of verses and, and make declarations like cause and effect. This, if you do this, this is going to happen, right? And that's a little, I'm just giving some cautions here, okay? It's here though, and it is written for us and it's written for our instructions. We just got to kind of figure out like, keep those boundaries in there. Let's keep it within the full counsel of God, not a let me grab a verse and do what I want with it so we're just going to be a little careful there okay and even if you've never actually experienced this yourself hopefully you could see truths in it like how could it happen or maybe next time you know if you're sick maybe next time you think hey it says right there I should call for the elders right Maybe you've never done that. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this now. Verse thirteen. It starts out with, "If anyone among you is suffering, have we seen the idea of suffering before?" We've talked yeah. about it today, right? Yeah. Okay, the people he's writing to, they're Jews, they're believing Jews, or you know, the group seems to be believing Jews, and they've been dispersed. Why are they dispersed? Because they just wanted to move all over the place. They're dispersed because they're being persecuted, right? They're they're being driven out of Jerusalem in particular, but driven into other parts of the world. There's a good purpose in that in one way, and that means the gospel spread. Like they were, they were kind of like the apostles right after Jesus's crucifixion were hiding out in the upper room behind a closed locked door. But then Jesus appears to them. And then later, the Holy Spirit by tongues of fire, you know, enters them 
And what do they do? They come out of the room. They come out of the room and they speak to large crowds. Peter speaks in that uh, Acts 2, uh, uh, sorry, sermon, and speaks in a way that everybody can hear and understand him. You know, that's by the power of the spirit. And then many people come to faith, but they're still staying right there in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the world. So guess what happened in the diaspora? The outermost parts of the world happened, <laughs> right? So sometimes I, I've had times in my life that I joke all the time about when we moved from Charleston, South Carolina to Altus, Oklahoma through the Air Force, that you can probably still see the claw marks <laughs> of me being drugged against my will. <laughs> It's not exactly true. It's an over-dramatization. But I just heard somebody the other day say, nobody ever wants to go to Altus, right? That was the mentality that had been given to me. I, I had not been to Altus. Um, but guess what happened to me in Altus? I got saved. Right. Yeah. Okay. So those claw marks, those drag marks, it's it's funny. It's a it's just to to give a word picture. It was a it was an amazing assignment in many ways because Johnny flew but stayed home. That was unusual. We had our third child there. I got saved. Everything in our lives changed. Blah, blah, you know, and that's where I met Precept. I had to be in Oklahoma, not Tennessee, where I'm from, where it's located. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, there's so many things that I can stack up there, but I can also stack up there. We had breathing difficulties with children, almost lost our second son a second time there. And there, and, and there was, there was a dichotomy of amazing, godly people and amazingly evil people. You know, we, we just saw so many things. It, it's an incredible crucible time or cocoon kind of time. I mean, crucible. Yeah, we were under pressure. But cocoon time, because God just wrapped me in protection in that so time. That's, so that's when you sing praises to him. There you go, right? <laughs> then you sing praises. But, okay, so here's the thing. The person that's suffering is told to pray, and the person who's cheerful is to sing praises. Okay, so in our pressure circumstances, in our enduring circumstances, in our patient circumstances, what attitude are we supposed to have? Cheerful, right? So in other words, he's not saying when everything's going great is the only time you sing praises. Now he's saying have an attitude of, I mean, he's not really saying that there, but throughout James, we can pull out the idea of you're not walking around with a long face. You're not moaning and groaning about your circumstances. You're not, you know, complaining to everybody else obviously you complain to god but he's saying when you're suffering pray and if anyone is cheerful which should be us all the time if nothing else ultimately we have salvation our circumstances may be horrible but we have salvation we can always find something even if that's all we can go back to is i am saved then we sing praises. So this is something, this should be an attitude. This is something we should be doing all the time. So is prayer. Prayer is something we should be doing all the time. Okay, so then you've got those two, you know, prayer and praises. Um, and then it's, is anyone among you sick? Here's the prescription. If you're sick, call. let him, the one that's sick, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Now, there was a question in your in your lesson about, where do you think this happens? Well, if you're sick, you're home and they come to you. That's a very strong possibility. And it, and it has happened in our church many times. Great. <clears throat> if that sick so, person can come to the church, that's okay too, right? If they meet in a park, that's okay too. <clears throat> it's really not about the where, but this, and okay. So when you looked up or you looked up some of these words this week, did you find what you, it might mean to be sick? Because we need to kind of think about that too. What kind of sickness is it talking about? It could be depression. Absolutely. It could be emotional, mental, right? Mm -hmm. What else could it be? I mean, the most obvious is physical, right? Mm -hmm. Does it have to be 
extremely awful, scary, horrible cancer that's stage four and just found and you've got three months to live? That would be a good one, right? But it could it be chronic inflammation <clears throat> that you just can't seem to get rid of or or something that you can live with. Like I have Hashimoto's, you know, and I can live with that. Um, I can try to do some things to to help myself, but would that disqualify me from this? No, not necessarily. Do you notice it doesn't tell you what degree, how bad, which sicknesses? It doesn't say that. So keep that in mind. If you're sick, then you call for the elders. Okay, who are the elders? Biblically, how do we define an elder? The leaders, right. the pastors. In our church, it's the government of the church. Okay. okay. <laughs> Dorothy's right. Sandy's right. Um, leaders, pastors. You're saying there's specific men that are, are defined as elders. And women. Right? And women. Elders. Biblically, elders can only be men. Well, biblically, okay. Um, and that doesn't mean women can't pray. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the role or the title of elder. Um, that is a in Second Timothy, I'm sorry, first Timothy chapter three, Titus chapter one, it's it's a man. And in many church churches they call them pastors. Um, sometimes there's the pastor and then there's elders that are maybe lay people. You know, it can be, but some places think it's only the staff, you know, I mean, there's, so there's different ideas of that, but I'm saying, if you look biblically, then you're talking about, we're not just talking about anybody that I guess that's one of my points. So we're not just talking about anybody we're talking about. And as Dorothy said, leaders, but there's also a role or a title or a office. Sometimes we call it an office of elder. And that should include what we call the pastor, you know, okay? Because the role of elders, there's other, there's elder, overseer, presbyter. These are all synonymous words that all mean basically the same thing. But one of their roles is to shepherd or pastor the flock. Okay, but that's a verb, by the way. Um, but there's also qualifications. They need to be able to teach. They need to have their household under control. They need to be the husband of one wife. In other words, they're not a womanizer. They're not supposed to be a striker or a, a pugnacious, a, a literal boxer type, a, you know, fighter. Um, there's other, other characteristics and qualities. Obviously, a Christian. <laughs> Obviously, that one. I'm sorry. I should have put that one first. But in this case, it's talking about calling for that those and and it says elders so it could be two it could be three it could you know there's no limit to how many right and then it says let them pray over him okay it also says anointing him with oil in the name of the lord okay now this is where it's like okay what does that look like what do you use right it doesn't say OK, but when you look at biblical practices of anointing, especially during that time to get some idea of what they might be talking about most of the time. And he's talking to Jews. Remember, they have that Jewish background. Most of the time, the anointing, not always, but most of the time it was to consecrate like a priest who was going into holy or the holy orders. Right. That's not saying that when they're anointing a person that that person's going to become a priest i'm not saying that but consecration is the idea of setting them apart okay so possibly what they're saying here is in the anointing they are setting that person apart for god's attention for that sickness okay does the oil heal them no no. no. Does the prayer heal them? Yes. No, prayer with faith. No, I say yes. <laughs> okay. And Dorothy said prayer with faith. That's part of this that I haven't gone to, but yeah, prayer with faith. But really, is it the prayer that heals them? Yes. 
this action is what is prescribed, but mm -hmm. God is the one that heals. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. And the only reason I make that distinction, because it is prescribed here. This is what we're talking about, right? And it says, it does say it, it says, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. But the caution I have here is if we're not careful, we get to where it's like, if I just have them say these words, right? Or if this group of men with this liquid do this thing to me, it's a, it's going to happen, right? Uh, I, I definitely believe what it says that, that this is a process and this is something we can call for and ask for, but don't get to where we think any more than if I took someone and dunked them underwater, that that's going to save them. Okay. We, we've got to kind of make a disconnect between my actions which is my responsibility and God's sovereignty, okay? Because if we turn back a page in my Bible, at least at the end of chapter four, it's talking about, you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. Right. Okay, so that applies here as well. Because here's the thing, if this was a, prescription and it's going to work every time just because we have this posture and these people do these specific things and say these specific words then why were people with Paul who had the gift of healing not always healed why did Paul have bad eyesight why and I keep using Paul but why did Paul have a thorn in the flesh that he prayed three times and God not did not remove? The answer to every one of those is because it was God's will. We've got to be careful that we don't come to something like this and say, all I have to do is anytime you think all I have to do is you better stop. <laughs> you better stop and rethink that and just say, okay, I'm sick. And I, I don't know what God's purpose in this. It could be part of my suffering that I'm to abide under. If I absolutely know that, you know, if God reveals that to me, then I don't should not be offering a prayer or asking for a prayer and saying, I'm going to subvert God's will. Okay. But do we always know that one way or the other? No. Sometimes our prayer is the reason we say in your name or as you will is because we can offer what as best we can, we think, but allowing ourselves in humility to be subject to his will. Otherwise, we get to a name it, claim it. And I actually did experience one time, the first time I actually saw something kind of similar to this was in a group of people I didn't know. I just knew one person, but that asked me to come. It was like a small group, like a home study kind of group where they did prayer and, and study and stuff like that and had meals and stuff. And um, there's this one man knew that I did Bible study and said, hey, you know, you'd be kind of a fresh voice. Why don't you come and speak to our group? So afterwards, he kept saying, you know, you can leave now if you want to. And I didn't realize until later he was getting uncomfortable because the next part of what they did was um, a little bit outside of my normal and my experience. I'm not saying wrong, just saying different. So I just I kind of watched and I observed. And at one point, they brought people to the center of the basically everybody sitting around in a circle to the center. And that person told whatever illness that they were dealing with and this man strutted that's the best I can tell you he was so self-important walking around and talking and proclaiming things and he had oil he had oil that he was going to put on that guy and guess what that guy didn't get up healed and I just sat there and watched it and went okay but that guy just, he was so self-important. This was absolutely, certainly whatever. This is not saying have confidence in yourself. 
This is not saying do this so that people notice you. This is not saying strut around because you're going to proclaim it. Go back a chapter and it's about humility. Okay, we got to keep the context, got to keep it all in mind. So as we pray, as anyone prays, it would be praying in God's will. And it might be God's will for that person to stay in that illness. It might be. It might be that that's the beginning of healing and it takes a while. Other things, you know, God's going to work it out over time. Because again, the purpose of suffering takes time. It and, and we don't get perfected overnight. And God might have brought that illness on purpose. But there's another factor in here that starts coming out is you may ask for the elders and they may come and you, they may be praying and they may be praying in faith. You've had enough faith to ask them to come. They're the ones praying in faith, right? So hopefully they have that. <laughs> like they're not just saying it because you asked them to, but they they actually believe, right? Believe in God for healing if he chooses and that he would use them to be a part of this practice. That That's not all of that's part of the faith part, but then maybe what comes out is that person comes under conviction of sin. Because if you look at, we didn't look a whole lot this week, but if you look at other parts of scripture, sometimes people are sick because of sin. But not every time. So if we, if we think that, have you ever been in a situation or heard even somebody talk about a situation and say, basically they're getting what they deserve, or it's not a surprise to me that they're sick because look at their life. You know, I mean, we may have all had thoughts like that. Let's be honest, but, uh, yeah. you know, and, and maybe even about ourselves, but if, if I'm sick, maybe one of the first things I need to do is say, Lord, is there unconfessed sin, you know? Show me my heart, show me your, you know, shine your light on me and then make sure that you all have dealt with and you're not in sin and you know, especially overt, like absolute sin. And then, then if you still are sick and you still feel like you should be calling for the elders to pray, call for them, right? But sometimes it's a result of the elders coming and praying over you. And sometimes like uh, you're sitting there going, you know, I guess I, I I could should tell you that something you don't know about me is, you know, and they confess sin. Um, And it says they'll be forgiven. You know, anytime we confess sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But does that mean I just confess like my mouth says the words? What does confess mean? You looked it up this week. What does confess mean? Agree with God. Right. To start now. I'm sorry. What? The repent. Repent. It has to be, should be definitely part of it. I want you recognize sin. You need to repent of it. Um, and the confession is agreeing with God about it, which means he's the one that defined it. Like I'm not the one that defines good and bad in your life. I might be taking from what God has said and saying it, but it's not me that made the rules. God's the one that made the rules. You have to recognize it's like a, it's like alcoholic anonymous. You have to admit and recognize your fault and truly be in your heart. Yes. yes. You're absolutely God. Right. There's no hope for that. You could put a person in a rehab program of any kind, alcohol or drugs or food or pornography or any program to because of an addiction you can put them in there you can even put them in a circumstance that makes them forced to go there like okay you can either go to rehab or you go to jail you know or you can go to rehab or your family's going to leave you you know i mean you can force a person and they don't feel like they have a choice okay but how effective is that program going to be no the first point of any rehab program is that person has to recognize they have a problem. 
And a lot of times they'll even recognize and admit they have a problem, but have they really seen it as sin, a problem? You know, that's, those are nuances. And sometimes that takes a little while, but we just know that we cannot affect that in someone's life. And that's a really good way of going about all of this and thinking about all of this is we can't affect any of this in someone's life apart from God. Okay, so sickness, yes, pray about it. Have others pray about it. Uh, bring the elders in, even go through a, a wonderful process, but the anointing oil doesn't heal the person, but it's part of what God tells them to do, right? And, and I will say, because I use essential oils, God has given us plants to support our bodies to, for food and for healing, you know, I mean, when, my son, <clears throat> when my son was in the hospital, uh -huh. the hospital pastor came around and uh, every single day and the prayers that he led us in and we actually felt the Holy Spirit in that room. But he also anointed Jimmy and Jimmy was unconscious at the time, but he remembered it afterwards. He remembers know how, but he did. He yeah, it. the prayer well, and everything. That's so. that's incredible. That's an incredible and yeah. it's an incredible practice that that man is doing. But think of the comfort that came from that. And that's and, what he was. And he, yeah, he wasn't saying that the anointing, right, or whatever anything was the one that healed him. Or I mean, Jimmy was still sick and he was still unconscious and everything. Right. But it, just you know, just the strength of the prayer was uh, unbelievable. Yeah, that's incredible. And I'm really glad. I mean, I know it was a very difficult time. So I'm really glad that you had that comfort in that time and that strength that came from it. And that this man is is practicing that way. That is, you know, that's what he, I, I'll just put, that's what he's there for, right? You know, I mean, let, let, right. let's, let's do that. Um, so in all of this, I just want us to catch the balance, right? That we're not saying, because here's, here's part of the pitfall of some of the other possible things, the cause and effect kind of thinking, the name it, claim it kind of thinking is if it doesn't work, if that person's not healed, who didn't have faith? Who, who, let's look around the room. Who didn't have faith, right? Well, it could be the person that called for it or it could be one of the elders, right? We're going to blame someone. But that means that it was up to them, right? And, and that's not, no, we just... We, we do in all of James, it's do what you're, you're called to do, do what, you know, God wants you to do, do what you should do as a, as a doer, as a believer, but that doesn't mean your circumstances change. Doesn't mean that it means you are changed in your circumstances. That's what this needs to fit in just like all the rest, right? This is a faith exercise. It can be tremendous. And here's the thing. What is the ultimate healing? Death. Death. Lord. If we're a believer, for a believer, it's the ultimate healing right because even if you die of from that disease whatever that that sickness or disease is you don't have it anymore as a believer you're free from it right i'm not saying let's pray for death <laughs> i'm not saying that i'm just saying would we look at we do this we have this done and the person dies and then we say it didn't work no, they're released. Okay. Salvation is our healing. Jesus brought healing to people. He literally cured some of their diseases here on this earth, but guess what? He didn't cure everybody. Could he? Yes. He was capable of curing everyone, but at the pool of Siloam, when he went to the one man and walked up to him, and said, 
would you like to? And then he said, take up your pallet and walk. And the man did. And he had been without ability to walk for decades at this point. There were a crowd of people around the pool of Siloam. Jesus could have not even gone, but while he was standing there, he could have said, all of you. Boom. But he didn't. Why? I don't know. Apart from that was the will of God and the rest was also the will of God. Was it because that man had the faith? Well, he, he did when he was talking to Jesus, but he didn't even know about Jesus before Jesus walked in. If he'd gone to every individual person after they saw that one, you better believe they would have believed. They would have wanted to believe and they would have believed. But Jesus didn't heal everyone. Sometimes I hear that. And I'll say, they'll, I'll hear people talk about it and they'll say, Jesus healed everybody everywhere. No. Or in the New Testament church, they'll call it everybody spoke in tongues. No, no, there are, there are places where they did, but not every circumstance. There's never a circumstance every time everything goes exactly the same way. Guess what that requires? Faith. <laughs> Faith. Because you don't know what exactly is going to be the outcome. It's not prescribed. It is not cause and effect. If I do this, this absolutely is going to happen. Apart from salvation, it isn't that way. We just got to be careful. Okay. That's the reason I said this can be a difficult passage. I struggled with this this week going, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but <laughs> sometimes you all have heard me say we're a bunch of yeah, buts, where we go, well, yeah, but God, you don't understand my circumstances. Yeah, but if you, is this only you have it, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but, and we need to instead just say, as you will, I believe you, God, do I believe in and I'll just use, because this can, we've already said this can be physical healing. This can be spiritual healing. This can be emotional or mental healing. It isn't just one thing. Think about that. It could be a combination because the spiritual healing would be the confession of sin, right? That would bring spiritual healing. Um, this could be a salvation moment for some people thinking they're saved, but they're not or whatever, you know, all of those can be part of it. But I'll just say in my situation with my son, I have had those times when I've said, you know, have, have I not been praying enough? Have I not said the right prayers. You know, I don't understand why you won't just fix this situation. But you know, bottom line is, I know he can. <laughs> I absolutely know with 100,000% faith that he can. Will he is what I don't know in, in the way I would want it to be. Let's just say, you know, I'm writing the script. God's not necessarily my actor. I don't get to tell God how it should be. I, and I call that sometimes defining my blessing. I'll feel blessed, God, if you will act in a certain way. No, I start with being blessed. I start there. It goes back to that cheerful statement. I am blessed. I am choosing to be cheerful, no matter what circumstance I'm walking through. And I'm going to give him praise, no matter what circumstance I'm walking through. Yeah. Is it always going to be like a, the other day, uh, Johnny, my husband, watched me and I was I thought I'd ruined my laptop computer because I poured water poured over the keyboard yeah and I was just sick I was just sick and I tried everything I thought later I realized one more thing to do but after a couple of days I put it I had tried and tried and tried to get it restarted and it wouldn't start and I just kept thinking shoot I've ruined this thing I've ruined this thing that's not cheap and then um, I was standing there with it after a couple of days of putting in her rice. I finally thought of that. And I put it on the, I'm standing at like a counter and I push the button and I'm not thinking it's going to work. And all of a sudden it comes on and my whole body reacted. <laughs> and Johnny said, I reminded of him this little th three-year-old girl that we know because you never doubt whatever she's, she's feeling, right? Her entire body reacts. You know, 
that's how we should be, right? But we're not always that. Sometimes our cheerfulness is just an act of my will. I choose to praise God in this moment. I choose to praise God. I mean, I, we had a situation recently where, again, in a, in, I think it was in a Sunday school class, somebody was talking about joy. And I was like, you know, as a, in, it was about First Thessalonians, but I was like, as a parent, children are a blessing. And I love all of my children. And I thank God that I have them, even the son who won't talk to me. I do not look and think about him and say, Lord, I wish I had never had him. I still love him and I still have joy as his mom. And it's not just because I can think of better times, but certainly that, that helps. But do I love my circumstances? No. And what, do I wish they would change and hope and pray they will change? Yes. Could I do a better job of being consistent? We looked at that in prayer this week, right? That persistent nagging person that goes to the judge and the judge finally says, I'll just give her what she wants to make her go away. I mean, don't you love that image? God wants me to nag him. Yeah, he does. Isn't that, co isn't that cool? Do you ever think I'm annoying God with my prayers? Actually, I do think that sometimes. And I've got to stop, right? I've got to go, God's not annoyed with my prayers. He doesn't mind that I ask him the same thing over. If he gives me a definitive answer, I need to stop, you know, <laughs> right? But just keep in mind, even about this, when someone is sick, yes, call for the elders. Yes, the elders should come and pray in faith. Yes, the elders should anoint the person. Yes, the elders should listen to confession of, of sin or ask if there's any, un, it might be part of the process of just saying, is there any unconfessed sin, right? All of that should be part of this process. And then as the Lord wills, will be the answer. It's not, an absolute, because again, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. It doesn't say heal the one who is sick. It didn't say remove the sickness. It could be what Sandy was describing with her son's situation, a restoration in a moment. Each time that man came to pray could be just that strengthening, strengthening of your faith. Strengthening of your hope, strengthening of your, and I mean faith, like your relationship with God, right? That can be part of this restoration. It doesn't necessarily mean, have to mean, it actually means save. The, rest the restore word in my translation can be translated save that person. But again, sa salvation can be the 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 moment you are entering into eternal life salvation, but it can be part of your life. Your sanctification process can be yourself part of your salvation as well. So we're saved and saved and saved, not re-saved, salvation saved, but throughout our life in, in, in individual situations. It could be that person is healed on the spot. That would be incredible. Jesus did that too. But it also could be that they're left in that particular sickness but their soul is saved isn't that the more important thing or it could be a secondary somebody else in the room gets saved right right and then that person's going to be excited because I don't care what I would go through I'd be excited if my circumstance caused someone else to get saved I'd be restored from that okay so if there's unconfessed sin it can be forgiven yes Jane you have to unmute, unmute. Sorry about that. Um, in 11, they're talking about endurance and um, the suffering, sickness and sin would, could and does bring a down heartedness. And um, these are the things I think would pretty much be restored because you would be, if you turn from your your 
suffering, sickness, and sin, and you pray or have others pray with you, then you would be reconnecting with God, and that would be strengthening your faith so you could strengthen your endurance to continue enduring whether you're, you know, whether what you think the problem is, is resolved or not. What I think God is resolving the problem is not to let this person get depressed or unconnected with himself. And um, honestly, during suffering, sickness, and sin, it's it can be easy to get disconnected. And you ask God, like, in those times, like, why me? You know, and, and really the answer to that is, why not me? You know, but I've been that person. Like, why am I going through this, God? I, I'm, I'm trying to live my life the way you want me to live it. And then you go back to James 1. It's like, well, um, do you want perfection and completion? Because the way you get that is suffering. I want to bypass the suffering. Just give me the crown, you know, <laughs> you know, give me the, give me the end result. Give me the goal. Like just douse me with the, the completion. It doesn't happen that way. And God has this process in place. So leaving someone in their situation can be the most loving thing that God can do. Look at Job. We looked at Job last week, but look at Job. Did he deserve to have his children taken? Did he deserve to have his flocks all taken? Did he deserve to have all of his servants taken? Not according to what God said about him. He didn't deserve it, but God allowed it. And then through the process of the next 40 chapters of Job, you get, there are some things in Job that had to come to the surface of pride. And that he didn't deserve to have children. Right. I mean, if, right. if I have children and somebody else is barren, I don't deserve it. It's a gift. Exactly. And so, you know, it, deserve is like, it's the fair Not a word problem. we can use. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's the fair problem. Like life is not fair. You're right. It's not. Should it be? Do we deserve anything? You're absolutely right. But when you also look at God pointed him out to Satan, it's not a cause and effect. Job didn't get something because of what Job did. Job didn't get what he got to start with because of what he did. That's what you're saying. Back up. He didn't even have what he had because, quote, he deserved it. But you know what? That was the perception. He was the most upright, blameless, godly man on the earth at the time. So his wealth and his comfort and his abundance looked like a result of that. But it's gone literally overnight. It's gone and one person after another keeps coming in and saying, you just lost this. You just lost that. You just lost that. And then his wife is like, just curse God and die. And then his friends come and it's like, you must have done something. The friend's message is you must have done something because it's always cause and effect. Nobody has bad things happen to them unless they deserve it. That's the friend's message. And at the end, really the overarching message is you didn't deserve what you had and you didn't deserve to lose it either. And you people are wrong. You better get Job to pray for you. Here's the elder praying. You better get Job to pray for you. <laughs> and once he does, then God restored and doubled his holdings and gave him back the same number of children. And he didn't deserve it. Right? He didn't deserve. It's the, the, the fair or deserved is a really good concept to just really marinate on for a little while. But it's true for all of us. It also goes back to what James is dealing with. The idea that somebody is rich because of the blessings of God and somebody's poor because of God's disfavor with them. Debunked. Debunked. It's about salvation in Christ alone. That's it. Anything else is gravy. Anything else is the cherry on the top. If you're sick, maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe it's unconfessed sin and that sickness would bring that to the surface and you and God can get that dealt with. It could also be the next part, which is um, confess your sins to one another. That means it doesn't have to just be to an elder. Becky said that earlier, to the one another's, right? You know, to the other people. 
pray for one another. Confess and pray so that you may be healed. Now here it does say healed. And the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. This word man is generic. The, uh, it should be person, or I'm going to say it person. The effective prayer of a righteous person can accomplish a lot. Okay. Again, what is it accomplishing? Does it necessarily mean cause and effect healing? No. Does it mean uh, support? Yes. Does it mean that the person praying is, you know, in a great relationship and point with God? Does it mean the person they're praying for is going to be uh, ministered to? Yes. All of this, all of this, right? We get to participate in this. I love it because otherwise there's only one group of few men that get to have anything to do with this. And that's not God's prescription. God's way of doing things. Yes, Jane. And here, mute. <laughs> Sin is something that we can do something about physically. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't keep ourselves from being sick. But sin, and I think it's very unusual that sin, something that I would be ashamed of, is something that we report to three different groups. That just, <clears throat> you know, that's a little bit too much revealing myself. But if you confess with other people, then they can help hold you accountable. And when you get into trouble and they can see that you're just about in trouble, they can pull you away. They can distract you. They can pray with you again. And you could actually get desensitized to this sin and stop having it as a habit. Yeah. And, 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 and if you know that people know you that well, that transparency and, and all, then you're less likely to think that you can hide something from them or get by with it, right? If you know you have that accountability set in, well, I just put it this way. Um, however often your church has a pattern of the Lord's Supper, of the, uh, right? It, some places it's it's monthly, some places it's quarterly, whatever, whatever. It, and maybe it's just, we decided this month, this week is a good week, whatever, when you go before that, especially if you know in advance, but if you just show up and you know it that day, spend time confessing sin because do not take the Lord's Supper. It literally says there are people that are sick and dying or asleep. It says I have died because they took it in an unworthy manner. There is a there is a cause and effect ish there where, you know, you do you need to. But the beauty of it is you keep yourself confessed up like you, it, that moment helps you have that opportunity. If you have that built in in relationships, whether it's family relationships or friends relationships or accountability groups through church, one or two people, like I said, it doesn't have to be every one. You know, you don't have to go in front of the church every Sunday or whatever day, Wednesday night, and confess everything you've done that week. You know, you, you don't have to do that. You can confess alone to God, but having others in your life that you can see that flesh and blood connection, because sometimes it's hard because God, we don't see, although he sees everything, if we keep that in mind, but then, you know, you're going to keep that cycle of sin shorter. You're going to have the help and the support to not go back there. That's why support groups for alcoholism work, because if you're going to show up to a meeting and you're going to have to, you're going to be able to say another week sober, or you're going to go, I failed this week and I'm starting over again. You know, I'm on day three again or whatever, then it helps tremendously to have that support group. So and if you're one of those people praying for someone, what an awesome ministry that is. What an awesome thing that we get to be part of. Intercessory prayer is an incredible gift because guess who's the primary intercessor? Jesus. We're literally doing Jesus's ministry to people and he's given it to us to do. We also have the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to people, reconciling people to God. These are all these things. We have the ministry of the gospel. We have the ministry of prayer. 
Um, it's it's a neglected one. And then you have Elijah. And it says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. This is similar to the statement that's made about Jesus in the sense of when he took on flesh, he felt what we felt. He experienced what we can experience. You can't have an experience that Jesus isn't aware of and hasn't had something similar or worse happen to him and we're not better than our master and so when you realize that but Elijah is not Jesus I'm not saying that but it's just saying when you look at Elijah and you know the story of Elijah we have a tendency to put him way up here like I can't be an Elijah I can't be a Paul I can't be a Peter they're not the goal Jesus is the goal if anything, we're looking towards them if we're putting them up there and Jesus is the one they're pointing us to. That's what Paul always says, follow me. But then he says, follow me as I'm following Christ. But he is a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three and a half years, three years, six months. Then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Short sentences, synopsis of three and a half years, pretty incredible but what you learned about Elijah was he had, he's a man like us. He just kind of seems like pops on the scene. We start hearing about him. He's an incredible man of God. But what is involved in this? Well, you, re, you looked up verses this week and everything else. What can we more can we fill in the gaps for these, these few sentences? The questions you got this week were what on what basis did Elijah know that he could have this confidence to pray? He is the model of the earnest prayer and faith. Yeah, it was a faithful prayer for sure. Absolutely. And it was based on what? What knowledge? His fellowship with God. His fellowship with God. That is absolutely key. His fellowship, his relationship with God, called by God. Okay, is that true of us? We don't have his necessarily exact ministry, but he has a nature like ours. He's a human. We're a human. We're called by God. If you're saved, you're called by God. Can you pray? Yes. Okay. Can we know the promises of God like Elijah knew them? Where God had said, you go into the land, you obey, and I will give you rain. You go into the land, you don't obey, I'm going to withhold the rain. That's what Elijah knew. I mean, that's a little yeah. But that's what he knew. Therefore, he knew he could pray that prayer. I think he also was led by God to pray the prayer. Don't get me wrong. But he also knew he could pray that prayer because of the circumstances that Elijah was living under, Ahab was the worst that had ever been. And on top of that, to make it worse, he married Jezebel. And then they built an, a temple to Baal. And then they put a Baal in there, a statue thing in there. Then he had the Asherah. And, and then he had, was it 6,000 or 10,000 prophets to Baal? Um, and who Elijah actually killed. In an incredible moment, if you haven't read that, go back and read it in Kings. Awesome stories. Um, and then with a nature like ours, he got scared. Elijah got scared. A Jezebel threatened his life. He had just killed 10,000 prophets. <laughs> he had just called forth fire to come down from heaven and consume a waterlogged offering where the others had been praying and praying and praying and praying and nothing had happened. Then he kills them. And Jezebel says, I swear I'm going to kill you. And he runs in fear. Can you relate to that? I can relate to that. The other is hard to relate to. This is easier to relate to. But when Elijah prayed for no rain, he was praying on the promise of God. And probably with the imperative of God to do it because he was a prophet of God and then later he prayed for it to rain and he sat and watched and there was a cloud on the horizon and he said we need to run because it's going to flood and it rained hard and they had to run and get ahead of it it's an incredible story it's an amazing amazing moment 
but you also have to realize he was a man used of God. Yes, absolutely. With a nature like ours, he was afraid. He got hungry. Guess what? He got affected by the drought. The stream that he drank from dried up. God brought him ravens to bring him bread and meat. And then God told him where to go next so that he could continue to provide for him. So suffering, we can be affected by the culture we're living in. Even as God's people with the promises of his protection and his provision it might be literal daily bread. It might be in Eliza's case, two times a day. He had to count on God, count on God, count on God, count on God. And then you also saw in Elijah's story, he started thinking, there's nobody but me. Because he felt very lonely. He felt very isolated. Do you ever think, is there anybody else in this world that is bothered by the what I'm bothered by? Or And we know there are. But doesn't it feel like, I mean, my husband and I were having conversations this morning about the stuff that's going on right now in our country. And we're going, who would ever have dreamed we would be hearing about this stuff? That anybody be thinking about this stuff? Like men walking into girls' locker rooms fully naked because they claim to not be a man. And these children are being exposed to that. When was that ever okay? But it's okay now. And a court of law will uphold it and did. That's what I was reading this morning. So we can be Elijah's. We can pray according to God's promises. We can pray just like that. But we also need to pray according to God's will. Um, and then the verses 19 and 20 are two of some of the most important verses in the entire book, because they are another way we could summarize this book, where he says, if any among you, son of the brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So this is again. What is our purpose on this earth? What is our purpose as a Christian? When you go back and you look at the end of four and it's talking about not speaking out against a brother, not judging because God is the judge, blah, 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 blah. And we can get hung up on that and say, we're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge. How in the world would I tell somebody they've strayed from truth without it coming off as me saying, I'm making a decision between two things. That's judgment, by the way. I have two things in my hands. One of them is a book and one of them is a marker. I am so judgmental. No, I'm just declaring truth, right? If I said the book was good and the pen was bad, that would be making, you know, I would be projecting my thoughts onto it. That's a little bit different. But here it's saying, so if you have someone in your realm of, you know, family, friend, churchgoer, whatever, and they're straying from truth, and it's obvious they're straying from the truth, but you go and you present that to them and you turn them back, like your, your statements help them see it and they get back on the path that God wants them to be on, then you have turn that sinner from the error of his way, saved his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. What incredible ministry we can have. But if we sit over here and say, well, who am I to say anything? Well, you know, yeah, I know they're committing adultery, but I, I shouldn't say anything because the Bible says I'm not supposed to judge. Really? The Bible says adultery is wrong. Hmm. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible basically says you can't continue in adultery. You can't continue in fornication. You can't continue in sexual immorality of any kind. That includes pornography. That includes bestiality. Everything. There's only one non-sexual sin. And that's a man married to a woman having sex. That's it. Everything else is sexual immorality. 
not an affair. It's sexual immorality. Call it out. In love, tell the person, are you aware that what you're doing violates God's word? Start there. And if like, so, yeah, but I just can't help myself. Well, as a Christian, you can. And I'll, I'll be right there with you. Just like we were talking before. I'll pray with you. I will help you. You know, I will, I will support you. I will I call you. You can call me and say, Hey, there's men. I know that, that work travel for work and they have people they call and say, okay, I'm on the road. When I get to the hotel, I'm going to, you can call me at such and such time. Make sure I'm not watching such and such on television, knowing they're going to have to answer to that person. That's the safeguards you need to put in pay. If your, your spouse needs to have passwords on the computer, so you can't get on it. So you can't go to pornography, you do whatever it takes, do whatever it takes, burn the thing, you know, get rid of it, get rid of internet, whatever. Uh, it's kind of hard to get away from it now. But don't sit there and say, who am I to say anything? Well, who you are is God's child who has the correct truth and you care enough about the person because if you don't turn them from their ways, they're headed to death. You're basically saying, go to hell. I don't care. Your complacency, your apathy is literally looking at them and saying, you aren't worth my time. I don't care enough about you to keep put you back, help you get back on the path. It's the exor exhorter that puts their arm around them and walks with them to that place. But guess what? You're standing at a distance and seeing what they're doing and you know exactly what they've done wrong. So you have judged them. But you're not a good enough person, not a godly enough person to show them that what they're doing is wrong and God isn't okay with it. That's not being judgmental as we use that word. It is loving them. It's the most compassionate thing you can do. So it's it's one of the impetus throughout the book of James. Is he dealing with people that are straying from truth? Mm-hmm. Is James doing 19 and 20 over and over and over and over again in the book of James? So be a James. It's like the instructions for the person and the elders that the sinner goes and confesses to. So like if somebody came and told you that they were, you know, whatever, it's like, mm, okay, I'll pray for you, but what do I do? Oh, what you do is you pray so that you can save their soul and bring them back. Right. So you, it's that's another work. instruction. Yes, I agree with you. And okay, so let's take the example of what we saw in a previous lesson of what if that brother comes to you who, a, a person, I'm not talking about a Christian necessarily, but a person comes to you and says, I'm hungry. And you say, go and be filled. What good does that do, right? Why don't you say, here's a gift card or sit down and I'll, I'll feed you or I'll take you to this restaurant and buy you some food. You know, that's, or I'll go to the grocery store with you, whatever. That's meeting their needs and, and all that. Saying kind words and I will pray for you doesn't, doesn't help them in that moment, right? Any more than if a person comes and confess sins to you and you say, I'll pray for you. How about we sit down with a Bible study? You know, how about we set up an accountability program? How about I help you get into a rehab program if that's needed? How about I help you get the need? It might not be me. Maybe I'm not equipped to be the person to give you the need, but I'm the, equipped to be the person to help you get the help you need. I will definitely pray for you. I'm not saying don't pray, but it's not enough just to say, you know, I'll just, I'll just guess I'll just pray for that person. No, put him back on the path. It physically might mean you physically go take them out of a situation, right? You would do that for your child, right? If your child was going towards the street, you wouldn't just say, well, I just really hope they don't get killed. You know, you'd run and grab them and pull them back. I, I had, my mom was fussing at me one time because I just, my, one of my sisters was straying from the truth. And she kept saying, why do you feel like you have to keep saying something? I said, I see her on the railroad tracks and I see the train coming. 
And she goes, yeah, but she's there. She wants to be there. I'm like, I'm going to do everything in my power to get her off the tracks. And then I said, I will scream. I will yell. I will hug her. I will shove her. I'll do whatever I can to get her off those tracks. And she goes, but she kept saying, but what if she wants to stay? But what I said, at the point where it's her or me, then she's going to get hit by the train. And then I'll probably call the 911 to try to get her help, whatever. But I said, you know, I'm going to do it, it. I'll be persistent, whatever it takes to get them off that track. And then later I came up with, <clears throat> it's like somebody on a treadmill with the treadmill across the train tracks. They think they're going strong in life, right? They're just heading and they're just booking it, right? And that train's still coming. That train's coming. <laughs> and guess what? We can see that even if they've got headphones on and hyper-focused and not looking. And it's our responsibility to do what we can to get them off those tracks. And this is off the tracks. In this case, it's talking about getting them back on the path, right? So we do what we can as much as we can because their life is at stake. And in that case, I'm talking about physical life, but this is talking about their, their eternal life is at stake here stakes are high that's the reason I use the phrase basically if you don't do anything you're looking at that person shrugging your shoulders and saying very casually go to hell because that's what is happening to that person they're on their way there can you get them off that track can you do what you can do? Can you share truth with them? Can you show them the error of their ways? They're not going to like it. They're not necessarily going to agree with you. They might call you all kinds of names. Other people are going to get upset with you and tell you to stop. You need to care how you do it. But I'm saying, if you are doing what God would ask you to do, all of that's still going to happen. You're not going to be popular. And you're going to have people say, when you ask them, because I've done this, I've asked them, why won't you say anything? You know, they may listen to you. If more than one person would come to that person and say it, then maybe they will listen. That's the reason for church discipline. That's the reason. But it doesn't start. I, Jane was kind of inferring this recently. It doesn't mean you, every little thing you do, you have to stand up in front of the whole church and confess it, right? Private sin can be confessed privately. Public sin does need to be confessed publicly. And if a person refuses to confess in whatever way they need to, they're not repentant. I don't care what you say. They're not repentant. When I've had so many people say, all I have to do is confess to God. Well, you actually kind of damaged a person. I think you need to go to them too. No, it's just between me and God. It's absolutely between you and God. But guess what God would want you to do? Go fix it with the person. <laughs> Right. be a doer not just a hearer right okay we need to end I thought we were going to end early today but it didn't happen um amazing book so very practical you have this tool in your tool belt go back to it you know go you can read you, over the course of the summer you can listen to these videos again 20 years from now if there's still internet you can listen to these videos again but certainly you have this word preserved, which I just appreciate from God so much that he has kept this word preserved for us in a language. He allowed it to be translated into a language we can understand and gave us all these tools that we can learn from and, and look up words and all that stuff so that we're not being told what it means. We can look it up. This inductive study is just incredible. So um, I'd love to hear from you if you want to share to me an email. If you if you tell me, I can share it with others. I will. If you tell me not to, I won't. Um, we can stay in touch over the summer. If you have prayer requests, I can send them on to the group. Um, but otherwise, this is the last lesson for now. And we will return sometime probably in August, I'm guessing, with summer study. Um, and I hope you have a great summer. I hope uh, James has impacted you as much as it has impacted me. But again, I'd love to hear from you as to how it has. Um, we ha we talked a little bit last week, but I'm going to end in prayer finally. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just, I can get so caught up in all of this because it is so incredible. It's incredible that it has been written. It's incredible that something that was written thousands of years ago is so real and important and pertinent to today. We're still humans. We still have these natures and we're still struggling with many of the same things. And we can learn from others, we can learn from things that have been done in the past. 
And we thank you so much that you caused James to write it down. You caused these circumstances that we can relate to, and you've kept this word. You've preserved it. You've allowed it to remain for thousands of years for us to be in this moment. No, no surprises in this moment and now. Help us to keep the balance always, to keep the balance of my responsibility and your, your sovereignty, not or, and both. It's both. And the, where I fall in that, to always come back to seeking your will, to uh, understanding that circumstances may not change. And the reason for that is I need to change or someone needs to change. Um, help us to see your will in all of it and just be open to that, that we would be submitting, submitting ourselves constantly to that, that humility and that acceptance and that process that we understand that is for our good, always for our good to help us to see that and change as a result and just keep us in the word so that we are constantly plugged into the vine, receiving that nourishment all the time so that we can thrive and we can grow. And we can also hopefully in turn affect others. We thank you for it all and ask for it all. Ask for the wisdom, the support, the guidance, the strength, the support from each other as well. Help us to seek those wise and mature people that would hold us accountable and that we can participate with them, whether it's confession of our sin or hearing their confession of sin and, and handling that with maturity. We just thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus name. Amen.